So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining this, this webinar. My name is Diego Barona. I am agronomist and project manager at and SensorWave, and I will be presenting this, uh, well, our, our presentation related to the color chain project. Just to give a little bit the introduction of the, of the context of, of the project, this is an innovation action project funded by the European Union. And what well, the four partners that have been involved in these projects are uh, what the Fiber Foundation, SensorWave, that these are both uh, technology providers. Then uh, Idel from France, that is a research institution, and Naturs, that is uh, an end user of livestock farming products. So, well, I'm going to be starting with a brief introduction of the, of the goals of their project. So, uh, the main goal of the cattle chain project is to enhance farm productivity uh, while ensuring animal welfare and the traceability of the beef and dairy supply chain uh, using IoT, uh, AI algorithms, and, and blockchain. Well, this is a, a real like uh, the overarching goal of the project. So mainly related to animal welfare, there is an increasing consumer de demand of animal welfare information. So this was a really a crucial point of the of the project and were really really related to this is farm productivity because if the animals are kept in a good condition the farm productivity is going to increase and well by using these different iot devices and ai algorithms uh, livestock farmers can make a really efficient use of of the of these tools to to enhance farm productivity and, and efficiency and well, mainly, well, I will explain uh, later on uh, the new generation of devices that we have developed within the project. But mainly, the most widely used uh, devices just before uh, starting the project were the GPS trackers that provide really useful information for livestock farmers, mainly in, in extensive livestock farming. And well, at the end, we have the blockchain information, uh, the blockchain technology that could be really useful to safely store this information and to provide this traceability use for, for consumers. And the main reason for using the, uh, make this combination of IoT devices and blockchain is that this provides a, a way of uh, providing uh, reliable data to consumers that it's, uh, it's a key concept to provide uh, the full traceability of the of the meat and dairy dairy supply chain. So with this next slide, the smallest, the uh, I would say the the data flow of the of the project of the cattle chain platform. So at the beginning we have uh, these different producers that could be the farmers like livestock partners or livestock breeders that they are installing these IoT devices on on their farms and this data is being sent to the to the cattle chain platform at the same time livestock farmers can either receive or send data to the platform so they get information to make uh, better better decisions and they can also uh, well provide information to the platform re related to the reproductive performance of the animals and um, well also veterinarians can can get information in in the platform to see all these animal welfare indicators and so on. And well, at the end, we have this uh, this QR code that would be would be storing all the information related to traceability um, that could be uh, well seen by any actor in the supply chain. Here we only have consumers and meat and dairy producers, but uh, we can also have public administrations that want to check all the information that is is being stored. So, well, this is more or less the, the overview of the, of the project. And now, we're, and now I will move on to the, to the part that SensorWave has been developing, that it's more related to the IoT device, new generation of IoT devices and AI algorithms. So, well, at, the, at first, we have been developing a uh, weight scale for field lots. So, this is mainly dedicated for intensive farming. 
uh, well, indeed, this weight scale has been designed, developed, and tested uh, within within the project. Within the project, and well, in the development phase, we have tested this uh, this weight scale, and we have more than one million records and more than well, one thousand and five hundred animal monitor in more than ten farms. And indeed, we have um, integrated this event detection that. Uh, we we gather this information from the waste scales with the blockchain to provide traceability information. So well, and also uh, related to farm productivity, this information is really useful for livestock farmers or farm manage, farm managers in fields because it provides the daily and accumulated weight gain of the of the animals, so they can make. Uh, a better allocation of, of resources and make better decisions on how to how to manage the farm. And well, also related to animal welfare, this device is really important because it provides uh, information related to the access to to water and feed of the animals. So yeah, because right the the waste scale is installed uh, where the drinking troughs are in the feedlot. So when the animals uh, go to drink the well, the weight scale is recording the the weight of the animal, and also with this with these tools we can estimate the number of animals per square meter, square meter. That it's not directly related with the weight scale, but it's another important indicator of of, of animal welfare. And as we have this information related to the frequency uh, of visits to the drinking troughs, uh, we can detect any abnormal behaviors. Uh, of the animals. Next, we also have developed a specific Bluetooth ear tags for for animals. So here, as you can see in the in this picture, uh, the small calf is wearing a an ear tag in the in the ear, and then we have the the cow with a GPS collar. So this Bluetooth ear tag is communicating uh, via Bluetooth with a with a GPS collar, and it's well, sending information uh, to this. So, well, this device is still under develop development, so it will be uh, commercially available maybe in the medium term because we, we still have to make some improvements mainly related to, to battery life. Nevertheless, uh, we have monitored uh, more than 100 animals in, in more than three farms. And we have seen that this device is really useful, for example, for heat detection and, and also for uh, well, seeing the cow calf relationship. As in the next slide, you can already see some information that has been derived from these devices. So, in the first one in the left, related to heat detection, you can see uh, well, this is specifically designed for natural breeding. So, the the ear tax would be would be located in the in the cows and then the GPS collar would be installed on the bull. So here you can see that uh, this specific uh, cow is being read uh, many more times than other cows. So and this period is 20, 21 days. That is the S2 cycle of the of the cows. So we can easily detect. Uh, that this um, this specific cow is on heat, and well, this is, has has been also interesting for uh, studying the cow calf relationship because well, as you can see, is is the same principle here. Uh, so uh, this specific cow would be uh, well the mother, let's say, of this of this calf, and we can uh, well study and also certify the time. Uh, spend with a uh, with a mother in the in outdoors maybe. Next, uh, well, we have uh, we have also been developing um, an additional collar that uh, this one includes a continuous accelerometer that it's it's really useful for getting information related to to behaviors, uh, let's say grazing, walking, inactive. And also, this device is still under development because we are having the, the same issues with battery life, so it should be available in the in the medium term. But we have seen already that this device is really useful for farm productivity and animal welfare, 
because it can provide really uh, really interesting tool for detecting Calvin and, and health issues that uh, well as this is as well uh, very much related with animal welfare because you can monitor the different behaviors and health issues of the of the animals as you can see in this in this graph well this text is in Spanish but you can always see by it's our the time that is spent uh, within a specific behavior. So the red one is inactive, green one is lying, uh, blue is walking, and orange is racing. So you can see the distribution along the day, and you can detect any abnormal behaviors. Finally, this is not an IoT device that is, but it's an. Uh, oh that he's, has been developed also within the project. And what well, this, um, this farm management app is already available and free to use. And it has been, uh, well, more than 7,000 animals have been included in the platform and it's mainly related to farm management. Uh, however, it's, uh, we only have uh, the first version of the, of the project that it includes uh, all this information about their reproductive performance. However, in future updates, we want to include recommendations to optimize reproductive performance and also keep track of disease and healthcare practices that could be useful for, for the farmers. Uh, well, this is a, really a, a picture also of the application of this meat traceability use. Here we have uh, an example of the information that could be provided with the, for the consumers. And what well, this this is all has been already integrated with with Fiverr, so the consumer can see where the animals have been grazing, uh, and also what um, the feedlot and the the times that the that the animal has been has been grazing outdoors and so on. And we have uh, different certificates. And finally, this is an additional service that that we have been developing and testing within the project that is related to grazing management using satellite imagery. So here we can measure approximately, uh, give some qualitative uh, information about the, the pasture availability. So this has been tested throughout the project in multiple farms and in, it's just, it would be commercially available in the short terms, let's say approximately three months. And this tool has us has also a really uh, great importance for grazing management because it provides information about pasture availability that well, uh, nowadays is even more important because the prices of the concentrated feed are increasing. So it's really important to make an efficient use of resources. And it has an additional benefit that it can measure uh, the environmental impact of, of livestock activities. So we can detect whether there is over or under grazing that it's uh, also really important for the, um, nowadays for consumers and also for farmers because what they want to make a, a good impact on the, on the environment. So, well, this is the, the end of my presentation. And what so, um, I, I would like to talk about uh, what we did in the project. Uh, we worked on the grazing traceability of dairy cows thanks to embedded uh, GPS sensors. Um, first of all, a few words about uh, the, um, the consu consumer requirements and ex expectations regarding welfare, because this is where it uh, starts, actually. Uh, when we ask them, uh, to the consumers, what do you consider as good welfare for dairy cows, they would say, uh, for instance, that the cows can express their natural behavior. Uh, that they they can have access to to the outside to the pasture so more naturalness in the production also comfortable housing conditions if possible less mutilation and pain relief uh, this is a picture with a, a cow with with horns uh, this is something we we do not often see in the in the field especially for dairy cows uh, basic needs to be covered of course they need to drink to to, to be um, to, to have enough feed and and being in good health but uh, overall the main 
uh, requirement is the access to the to the outside. So from uh, from these several dairy uh, factories decided to launch the pasture milk label. Uh, as you can see here on uh, on my screen, there are several in in France and probably in Europe. There are, there, there is even more, and these uh, pasture milk labels they have some specifications. They could be different depending on the dairies, but most of them have a minimum, uh, ask a minimum of six hours per day of grazing to be considered as one grazing day. And they ask uh, a minimum of 120 days per year uh, to be considered as, um, yeah, to, to respect the specification. So um, at the moment, to check if the specifications are respected by the farmers. The current verification, the current control is done on farm by an audit. So an auditor is uh, going to the farm and is looking for some evidence <coughs> of uh, grazing. These evidence can be uh, the presence of uh, fences, of drinkers in the pasture, uh, the presence of dunks um, in the pasture, showing that the cows are going out outside and they also ask the farmer to fill a paper grazing calendar um, that will be checked once a year to see if uh, the cows have been going outside. So every uh, black box, box uh, is uh, one day on one of the paddocks of the, the grassland. Um, so this is the current solution and it's quite time consuming, expensive, and it's done uh, once a year to once every two years. So it's not continuous at all. And the, the idea was to use, and this was our concept and what we tested and developed uh, within the, the cattle chain project, uh, to use a GPS collar uh, developed by, uh, by uh, sensor wave uh, to check if we were able to uh, uh, automatize completely this process. So the GPS collars, they measure the cow location every 11 minutes. So we can have the cow location uh, several times per day. Then we developed an algorithm to measure automatically the, um, grazing, the grazing time. How did we do that? Uh, we used the density of the location point. As you can see, it's maybe a bit small, in your screen, but um, you can see in the in the in the picture, in white the cows that are outside, in black um, the location where they are inside the barn, and of course the density is higher in the barn than in the pasture. So, with an automatic algorithm, we can segregate and identify where is the barn, where is the pasture, and then calculate a grazing time. Uh, but also identify the paddock, the, 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 the exact pasture where, where the cows were, uh, and calculate at the end the number of days uh, grazed per year. So that was validated during the project on two experimental farms uh, over uh, two years. Uh, we, we compared our estimated uh, grazing time, so what we called the T out, uh, and we compared it to the reference T out. So we had a scientific approach uh, where we recorded precisely the number of hours uh, for each cow spent outside. And uh, as you can see on the correlation graph, there is a strong color correlation between our uh, estimation and the reference time out. At the end, the, the, the root mean squared error that we made were approximately from 17 minutes per day to 50 minutes per day, depending on the farm and the year. But it was quite acceptable uh, for our um, use. Then we decided to test it on real farms, uh, because this is the real life, actually. <coughs> on experimental farm, we can uh, um, uh, we can set up all our uh, conditions and uh, it's of course easier. So we wanted to, to, to test it on, on real farm. So we, um, we work with two dairies, one in Normandy and one in Massif Central. So one in plain condition, uh, the other one in mountain condition. Um, you have the two 
uh, there is here a maître laitier du Cotentin and Jeune Montagne, and uh, they found 22 farmers to, to, test, uh, to test it. So uh, while we were testing it, we also developed additional tools that could be used by the, the dairies to have additional evidence of grazing. You can see uh, an, an auto automated grazing calendar that we are able to um, uh, that we are able to, 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 to give for each farm and, and, and to the dairy. Uh, you can see all uh, it replaces the paper actually, the paper grazing calendar. And you can see that it, but it, each box represents a, a, a day grazed on one paddock. You can also see the, the grazing time that is monitored all over the year. So for each cow or for the average herd, we can est estimate the number of hours uh, outside per day for that herd. Uh, we can also, this is um, on the bottom left, uh, it's similar to the grazing calendar, but it's represented over the satellite uh, image. Uh, each point, color points, represent one um, co-location for one day. So each color represents one day. So you can see that there is a rotation between the paddocks, uh, three days on the left paddock, three days on the right paddocks. If, if you uh, follow this on more uh, weeks and days, of course, you can see that the cows are grazing all over the, the different paddocks. So uh, this is a clear evidence that the, the, the cows are grazing and are, are outside. Uh, we can also provide, but this is something that will was also provided by uh, Digit Animal, a heat map showing that uh, where the, the cow grazed preferentially in the paddock, so that can help to manage, uh, to better manage the, um, the, the grass, uh, the grassland, uh, and to see uh, where the, the cows are more eating the grass and less eating the grass. So that can help us to help them to, to, to better manage their uh, grassland. Um, well, so at the end, uh, what I would like to say uh, is that um, we saw that it was really a promising method for mon monitoring grazing time. It was really accurate and reliable when we had the good network coverage. Um, however, the, 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 the network coverage can be bad in some areas, especially in the mountain. And we had quite a lot of uh, gap in the data. So in these cases, it's more difficult to estimate accurately the grazing time. However, you can still show that the cows are outside, even if there are some gap, you can still build the grazing calendar and, uh, and show the rotation in the paddocks and so on. But there is still an improvement to do uh, about this network coverage or to find uh, uh, alternative uh, networks or uh, technologies to, to be able to track and, and to, 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 to provide a solution in, in all cases. Uh, the farmers also told us that they were maybe waiting for a more versatile device. Uh, at the moment, it's not, it's only um, locating the animals, it's only geolocation. They would like, uh, so that it could be useful for them uh, to have also heat detection, health issues, uh, why not calving detection? So additional uh, services from the, from the device. As I show you um, from the GPS, we can, we can also build additional tools, not only for, uh, for the dairy, so that we can uh, track the, the grazing, but also additional tools that can be helpful for the farmers to manage their grassland. Uh, at the moment, we did not include this use case in the blockchain, so we have all the key information, but the step to include it in, in, in the blockchain and, the, and to secure the information is still to, is still to do. Um, and I would say that there is still a question, but it's, this is more for discussion, about the business model, because uh, if we would like to implement this on the field, of course, uh, the question is who will pay? Uh, do the farmer buy the collar? Or is it the dairy factory that sell the milk uh, who will invest in these devices uh, uh, because they consider that it, it, it is useful for them? So this is still a discussion we have 
with the dairy factories uh, we worked uh, with. So. Yes, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, not about a functional uh, component, but uh, about a technical component. Uh, it's a technical, technical component, which is called Canis Major. It's part of the fiber. It's integrated into the fiber. Uh, the initial version is the one that I'm going to explain, and then uh, the the next uh, steps. Okay. Now uh, you can see that this is already in uh, the Fiber repository. Okay, and you can just start using the the system. Now, what is Canis Major? Canis Major is a component to uh, write to the blockchain or to use to the blockchain and integrate the blockchain uh, into the Fiber uh, architecture and the power by Fiber applications. But uh, this is not about exchange of digital value. So this is not about tokenized money or cryptocurrencies or even tokens which only exist in the blockchain. Okay, so we are talking about uh, registering things uh, about objects that exist, like codes, outside of the blockchain in the real world. Okay, so uh, uh, in particular about a use case that is uh, very very common in the real economy okay not just for this use case but in general in many many cases uh, which is called certification time stamping notarization even though notarization is not the right word for this uh, like for example a typical use case uh, diplomas interoperability about diplomas many types of certificates anything that uh, where you need the proof of existence in the past of an object which is external to the blockchain Typically, this is uh, a use case where you have one right in the past and then many, potentially many verifications reads in the future. Okay. And uh, by the way, uh, this also applies, can is major, to what I call decentralized workflows, which is in reality a generalization of notarization. And you can see decentralized workflows. Uh, for example, in, 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 in cattle chain, where uh, you may have one or several actors saying something or registering something in the blockchain or in a tamper system uh, storage uh, about something uh, in, at different times. Okay, so at the end, this forms a chain of, of events that are all tied together, and then you can, uh, let's say, do something called the provenance of data which, by the way, we are collaborating uh, also in the standardization of this, okay? So, and by the way, these decentralized workflows is uh, not just about uh, simple notarization or time stamping about things, but it also includes the exchange of ownership of a good if the register exists also outside of the blockchain. So you could use Fiverr and the Canis Major component for doing this type of use cases. Now, what are the requirements or the things that we need for implementing a trusted proof of existence in the past of something? Well, first we need time stamping. Uh, time stamping in the sense that uh, it should be impossible to falsify documents and create documents from the past. So it should be impossible to say, hey, I forgot or I want to, in to invent a, a, a diploma that, that doesn't exist or an event that didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, let's say, did this audit and then I want to invent a document today. Should be impossible. So this is the role of time stamping. But of course, it has to be immutable. Immutability doesn't exist. Okay. So in reality, it should be impossible to modify the contents without being noticed. So I prefer the word tamper evident than immutability because there is nothing in this world which is totally immutable. Okay. And of course, an important property is uncensurability. So a company or group of companies cannot avoid that others access the proof. That means that once you write something, you can never deny that you did this writing and that you said something in the past. Uh, with a central database, uh, you can uh, just censor this, not publish or stop publishing the event. But once you write into the blockchain or into this uh, trusted log, then you cannot avoid that anybody using an independent verification method can verify that you actually did say something in the past. Then to be complete or fully complete, you need identity because uh, you need to know who is saying what. 
otherwise uh, you see things that uh, uh, are uh, coming from you don't know who and then of course privacy depending on the data that you write to the blockchain of course it is forbidden to write anything related to personal information or to natural persons but when we are speaking about uh, uh, juridical entities privacy uh, is more related to let's say uh, merchant secrets and so on okay so trading but the idea is that nobody knows more than is strictly required so if you don't want everybody to know uh, some data item don't write the data to the blockchain because otherwise everybody will will know even if it is encrypted at the end they are going to the encrypters okay now for each of these individual requirements there is already a current technology to solve uh, each of the requirements. But if you take all of them together, right now I only know of two technologies, the combination of two technologies that can solve the problem. Blockchain for timestamping, immutability and uncensorability at the same time, and verifiable credentials for identity and privacy. Canis major for the moment, is only focused on uh, the blockchain aspect. So timestamping, immutability, and uncensorability. And now, just one second, because, ah, okay. And uh, this is uh, the whole picture of Fiverr. In this case, this is the smart city reference architecture of uh, Fiverr, but it applies to any, any uh, Fiverr uh, application. And then you can see that this is the uh, Canis major thing. Okay, so Canis Major is a small piece, it's a component which is just part of the whole picture and is just adding the ability to uh, transparently write things into the blockchain and do the time stamping and the notarization. Now, uh, the working or the usage of Canis Major is extremely simple. Okay, Essentially, uh, this diagram uh, tries to represent this. If you are already using Fiverr, Canis Major is fully integrated into uh, the Fiverr architecture. And Canis Major has essentially two modes of usage. One is fully transparent, and another is um, directly used by the application in required advanced functionalities. Okay, But if you have an existing application and the uh, default uh, functionality of Canis Major is enough for your application, you don't really have to modify the application. You just uh, use Canis Major, install it, configure this, uh, and this is represented here, okay? And then it's working. So what do we see here? We see the client application in the client domain using a standard NGSI LD uh, interface to uh, access the context broker to create objects, NGSILD objects to update them or even to delete them and to query them. And this uh, circle represents, uh, okay, maybe uh, a pet proxy, uh, a, another type of proxy, a reverse proxy. I mean, these type of components that are fronting the context broker, typically in, in typical uh, implementations. And then Canis Major uh, uses exactly the same interface as context broker. That's the idea. Canis Major uses NGSILD interfaces, but the functionality is not to store the object like a context broker, is to do the timestamping of the object. So in transparent mode, your application works exactly the same. And then this component, for example, uh, there is a fork of uh, the pet proxy, Vilma, that uh, does this automatically. So passes the request to context broker, Context broker executes the request as normal and then passes the same request, exactly the same, to Canis Major. Then Canis Major uh, does the timestamp into any Ethereum compatible blockchain node. Right now, this is working in production in one uh, blockchain network, which, by the way, is compatible with the EPSI, the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure Blockchain Network, which is just coming into production during this year. But uh, for the moment, uh, we are using the Alastria blockchain network, which is composed of 200 nodes and so on. Okay, we will see a little bit about this. Now, this wallet is an optional component. So if you only have one entity, Canis Major, by default, can use, let's say, the identity of uh, the entity operating this. But it can be multi-tenant. So you may have different uh, identities 
of uh, applications writing into the blockchain and then as i said uh, you would need to digitally sign with different private keys because you probably know that writing to the blockchain means that you have to digitally sign to use a private key in order to write to the blockchain okay so this is the role of this component which is already working but this only is required again if you need different uh, private keys representing different uh, identities of different companies using the same instance of Canis Media, which is not the case in Cardinal Chain right now. Okay. So by the way, once Canis Major has written to the blockchain, Canis Major stores or can be can be configured to store the digital receipts, I mean the proof that something has been written into the blockchain into context broker, because in the typical use case, the company writing into context broker and then writing into the blockchain in order to prove later something has to have uh, uh, something like uh, like when you go to a restaurant and then you buy some food and then when you pay you get the receipt the receipt is the proof that you paid for this food okay so then uh, this is the the the, the way or uh, the reason uh, this is called the receipt of the timestamp this is a digital receipt that then you can use to prove that you wrote something into the blockchain in the past okay so this can be sent to uh, consumer organizations to auditors to consumers directly uh, you can do whatever you want or just uh, put a qr code and then uh, store this into or sorry stamp this into the final product or any intermediate product in the chain the logistic chain okay now these are the uh, current APIs, can, uh, can is major APIs, and you see that they are NGSLD, so mm, they work exactly the same, uh, but there are some slight differences. If you are operating in non-transparent mode, so directly using can is major, then you can use those advanced functionalities. But uh, just to, I don't want to enter into very uh, technical details, but you see here, uh, if you can read this, uh, this is a small that you can store in the blockchain, not just the creation of one object, but also the different stages, the life cycle of the same object, which has the identity here, okay, the entity ID, and then the transaction details, you have an array, this is a represented in JSON, of uh, transactions happening to this same object. Typically, you would have uh, depending on the complexity of the application you can just create one object and that's it because typically for example in this uh, in, in cathedral chain uh, once you have uh, sensed something and then you have made some calculation then you store this into the context broker and then you store into the blockchain uh, the timestamp and that's it okay and then you can prove uh, later this but for more more complex uh, use cases okay you have the functionality uh, a single operation registered in the blockchain would be something like this, but let me do just a very quick demo so you see uh, something already working, like for example, this is an instance, okay, which is a little more complicated, I hope you can see everything, so you can see the entity list, uh, uh, you can query, this is uh, actually operating into the blockchain in production, okay, so I am going to query this. Put this here because I don't see. Okay, that's it. And then, uh, by the way, uh, I am doing something that you should never ever do in a webinar. So this is real time. Okay, so let me get the, the last. Okay, the last. You can see here all of the information. This is already stored. Uh, okay, no, let me let me then do something more. Sorry, sort more complicated. Uh, let me write entity creation let me create an example entity so you will see and then we will talk about the properties so let me change this, this is one example this is uh, hello test okay i hope this is unique then uh is executing okay and then you see the result okay it's a json let me put this a little bigger okay so you see this the result has some the identity of the entity storing this into the blockchain this is uh, represented as a verifiable credential let me talk uh, later about this but this is a uh, the essential receipt 
there are several items, but one which is very important is the transaction hash. Because the transaction hash is something that anybody, once you have this digital receipt, you store this digital receipt, and then you can uh, put it into a QR code or, or you can send this uh, to anybody, then anybody without having to go through your server in an independent way, as far as they have access to any node in the blockchain, and the blockchain has to be public access, okay? So it has to be a public good because private consortium for pri private blockchains uh, actually, uh, they work very badly for this. So it has to be something like EPSI or like Alastria or like uh, any other uh, public permission blockchain network. Then you can go here and you can see that, for example, in Alastria, this is the actual world. Uh, there are currently 90 million blocks, which uh, essentially is uh, more than two years of uh, operating without any disruption. Uh, and then let me look at the transaction. I just put here the transaction has, which is a very long identifier, identifying the transaction that I did in real time, okay, in front of you. And then we can see here that this is a transaction. You have to trust on this because I, we don't have a, a lot of time, but you can see here the timestamp, okay, from the blockchain, which is today at 10.52.37. Okay, so the precision is just uh, one second, two seconds, uh, it's not milliseconds, but it is more than enough for most use cases in the real economy. Okay, then here is the transaction, then you see here uh, some data, okay, input data, uh, which is metadata, so you can store some limited amount of metadata into the blockchain. Uh, these are just uh, hashes, so it tries to, this is a general browser, so typically you would have to develop an application that queries the blockchain and then displays the data in a human readable uh, way. So I'm using a very general tool for any transaction. So uh, this is just to prove that the transaction is there. It was stored there. The data was here. Okay, you, saw, you see this. This is what I wrote. It's actually something. This is not invented. And these are uh, the hashes. This is the hash of the object ID. And this is the hash of the whole object. So nobody, nobody can tamper with the data that is in the context broker. So if you erase the data, of course, uh, it's in the context broker, it's not in the blockchain. The blockchain doesn't store the full data for the object, just some metadata. So this metadata is, uh, well, the location, the coordinates, and the uh, parking spot uh, identity, okay, for example. Okay, and uh, I would say this is everything regarding the demo. And what are the future steps? And then I'm, I'm going to finish. Well, to implement uh, what I call a full trusted transparent timestamping system. Okay. Uh, uh, if you remember, I said that the full solution uh, has to include verifiable credentials for identity and privacy and the blockchain. And we are focusing here right now. Okay. And right now, uh, in order to uh, complete this, we have to complete the functionality of timestamping. By the way, the functionality in Canis Major is not 100%, but the current functionality is production ready. So it's production ready for the functionality that it implements, but we are adding more functionality for uh, more complex use cases. Okay? And scalability, and this, uh, we, we come to the question that uh, you said before. Right now, for each time you write to the context broker, uh, uh, Canis Major is writing to the blockchain. This is the current implementation, but there's a, 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 another implementation which is coming very soon that uh, is implementing a strategy uh, that for most use cases is uh, exactly fitting the, the requirement, which means that uh, we are implementing a transparent log in much a way that uh, certificate transparency is uh, certificate transparency is implemented. I don't know if you are aware of how this works, but in any case, there's going to be a lock maintained outside a cryptographic law lock with Merkle trees implemented outside of the blockchain, and then uh, periodically the root of the Merkle tree is going to be stored in the blockchain. So with this type of uh, scheme. For this type of, uh, of, of use cases where you write something 
uh, and then you have to prove something maybe in one week, in two weeks, in one month, okay, because this is the typical use case for, for uh, full traceability and, and, and cattle chain, then you can, uh, you can prove the inclusion of some object thanks to the magic of Merkle trees, and you can uh, write to the context broker and to Canis Major, uh, the idea is to support more than 10,000 transactions per second per instance of Canis Major, okay? So this should be more than enough for, I would say, more of the, of the use cases. And the blockchain is going to be just writing the root of a Merkle tree, and the Merkle tree is going to be able to represent or to, 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 to be able to prove the inclusion of some object into the Merkle tree and then into the blockchain, okay? Uh, we can we can we can talk about this uh, later. Then uh, it has to fully support the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure uh, Blockchain Network, which is coming from the from the European governments. And then, uh, of course, in Fiverr, we are also very active on the verifiable credentials, identity, and, and privacy uh, scheme for data spaces for other areas. But uh, this verifiable credentials and this new way of digital identities and digital identity wallets uh, is going to be integrated with uh, Canis Major. So uh, we will have integration with verifiable credentials and decentralized IDs, okay? Uh, we will also improve the verifiable receipt, okay? So it can be then uh, be put into a wallet and then you can use wallets not just consumer wallets, but enterprise wallets to manage, to store, to, to send and prove things. And then, uh, of course, it will be again fully aligned with the future European Union digital identity, which was announced by uh, the president of the European Commission uh, several months ago, and that is going to start execution very, very soon. And this is the end.